Welcome to St. John's Lutheran Church, Springfield, Ohio. Today is the 22nd of March. This is our midweek Wednesday evening Lenten service. St. John's is located at 27 North Wittenberg Avenue, Springfield, Ohio. Telephone number is 937-323-7508. Good evening, everyone, and welcome. Uh, today <coughs> we're doing something special. As I announced on Sunday, we will be using the evening prayer service and Pastor Carol Gesselman, recently of Fifth Lutheran, now retired, has been so kind as to come and lead this course. So uh, I will now turn it over to Pastor Carol. She will explain how this service works and what will we be, what we will be doing throughout the service. My congregation always did evening prayer during Lent. So when I was worshiping with you last week, I decided to offer to do evening prayer when he said the theme tonight would be worship. I knew it was an old service, but I didn't realize how old until I started researching it. It is the most ancient service that the Christian church knows of. It was worshiped as early as the early second century, which means Jesus was dead for only about a hundred years when the church was using this worship service, obviously not in English. Um, the service is found on page 309 in the ELW hymnals. It is called Evening Prayer. It is also called Even Song. It is also called Vespers. But in our hymnal, it's called Evening Prayer. It begins on page 309. Now, you don't know the music, try it. I'll try to lead it. By the way, I have a really bad cold, so if I start hacking and coughing, we'll just wait until I finish hacking and coughing. Um, this, we've substituted a hymn for the gospel canticle. The hymns are listed up here. The service focus is on light. And I begin the service in the back, carrying in a candle, representing the light of Christ. Um, as soon as I get up front and put the candle in the candle holder, that's when we sing 229, which is part of the service, just to give you a heads up on that. You do not know how to sing the Lord's Prayer, so rather than try to do that, we will pray the Lord's Prayer spoken, but I warn you, it is the newer translation of the Lord's Prayer. The older one is not printed in evening prayer, but we will pray the Lord's Prayer as it is printed in evening prayer. Um, other announcements I'll make as we go along. Okay. So anyone have any questions? Not until we don't know what you're doing. Okay, <laughs> good, then you can ask. <coughs> Thank mm -hmm. you. 
from the 95th Psalm, verses 6 and 7. O come, let us worship and bow down. Let us kneel before the Lord our Maker. For he is our God, and we are the people of his pasture and the sheep of his hand. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. And a reading of the Holy Gospel according to St. John, the fourth chapter. Glory, Glory to you, O Lord. Jesus said to her, Woman, believe me, the hour is coming when neither on this mountain nor in Jerusalem will you worship the Father. You worship what you do not know. We worship what we know, for salvation is from the Jews. But the hour is coming and is now here, when the true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and truth, for the Father is seeking such people to worship him. God is spirit, and those who worship him must worship him in spirit and truth. The Gospel of our Lord. Praise, Praise to you, Lord Christ. Yes. As you came in, I hope you picked up the information that was on the gold stand. Because it is necessary for this evening as we consider what is worship. <coughs> What is worship? Is it for the purpose of gathering together and being entertained? Or is worship for the purpose of the community of faith gathering together to worship and give all praise and focus on God? I, worship is the center of the Christian life. It is a basic part of our life lived in response to the God who chose to reveal himself to us in the form of Jesus Christ, revealing all we need to know about him, and also to reveal what he intends for us. So with God having done this, having humbled himself, coming down in a form of one who was truly human and truly divine, experiencing everything that we experience, and in that same time, showing what he intends for us and what he has waiting for us, we are to respond to that. To respond to that love first shown to us by God. Now, often when we talk about worship, we hear that worship involves giving God the highest worth or value. And that is appropriate because our word of worship comes from an old Anglo-Saxon word, worthship, meaning to place value upon. So when we say we are worshiping God, we are saying we are doing an action in which we place a lot of value upon, and it is very important to us, that it is something that we do not take lightly, uh, that it is something that is important in our daily life. As Christians, we acknowledge and affirm God's worth and recognize Him as the highest value in human life. That He is the most important activity that we can do. However, in today's world, unfortunately, there has been some change in the attitude towards worship. Where people today, even within the community of faith, See worship as a drudgery, as a burden, as something they have to do, as something that they would prefer not to do. We see even those within the community of faith complaining about the commitment every Sunday to worship or complaining when the church has special worship services for special days uh, and thinking it to be unnecessary. There are even those who claim to be committed to Jesus Christ, but who will sleep in on Sunday morning. And this transpires all areas of the Christian community of faith. When I was in seminary, there were classmates of mine who would not go to church on Sunday morning. Here they were in seminary, training to be parish pastors to lead the community of faith and worship, and they would sleep in. Their excuses were, well, I'm going to be doing this for the rest of my life, so I'm going to take it 
advantage of sleeping in that. Now, if you remember the old Hannah, uh, School of Theology on Whitworth's campus, it had the academic side and it had a living side, a dorm side. If you lived in one of those dorms, like I did for a while, 11 o'clock we were chapel at church, 10.30, you could get up, jump into the shower, jump into some clothes, and be at Weaver Chapel before the opening hymn. And some of my classmates, they would not do it. The worst were the ones who would come back from their year of internship for their final year and would complain about how they had to get up every Sunday while on internship, so now that their last year and soon they're going to sleep in. Such an attitude would never have been even a thought of on a seminary 20 years before I arrived in seminary. And that is the way much of our culture is. That worship isn't really that important, or I can worship by myself, or I can worship God in nature, whatever. Yet for the Christian, this is supposed to be the highest form of activity, the most important activity that we can do. Usually when you think of worship, you think in terms of going to church. Well, the reality is. The word church means the community of faith, us, the people who believe in Jesus Christ. The word church also can mean the building in which we worship God. So really to say you go to church simply means you're going to be with other believers in Jesus Christ or you're going to the building for some reason, maybe to make a repair in one of the classrooms or to mop the floor or polish a pew, whatever, that doesn't mean you're worshiping. Uh, the real proper thing should be we are going to worship. That is to be more accurate because church is a place for people. Worship is an action. And that's what worship is all about. Doing action worthy for God. Giving thanks to God for all he has given us. So why then do people go to worship? The sheet I gave you lists a bunch of reasons why we go to church. So let's examine each one of these. First of all, to pray. People go to worship to pray. Pray for anything, anybody. Pray for any place. There is nothing that, uh, that says you can only pray for certain things when you're in church. The Lutheran church I grew in the first 13 years of my life had the tradition, the tradition of once you came in from the narthex and entered the sanctuary, you went to your pew, you sat down, you pulled down the kneeler, you knelt <laughs> for a few minutes of private prayer, sat back in the pew, put the kneeler back, and waited for the organ prelude to begin. That was the time to pray. It was also our tradition that after communion, you would go back to the pew, you put the, the kneeler down if it wasn't already down because we had knelt during parts of the communion liturgy. And you would say, have a time of private prayer after communion, waiting until everyone had communed. And the pastor was ready to give the communion blessing. So those were two times where we were given that opportunity to pray on our own instead of simply the prayer of the church or the prayer of the day uh, that are organized. So we come to pray. We come to worship in order to be strengthened. To be strengthened to face another week. To face another week that may present us trials and temptations or trials and tribulations. Coming to worship to ask God that through that power of the Holy Spirit He give us a strength to face whatever this new week may present before us. We come to worship to be comforted. Maybe we lost a loved one and we need that comfort that promise and that being a part of that great cloud of witnesses or that mansion prepared for us by Jesus Christ himself or maybe we need to be comforted for an upcoming surgery or some kind of medical treatment or maybe we're having a change in our life maybe something that's going, has happened that is totally going to have a negative impact on our family. When I was in high school, my parents had a good friend who was in middle management of Alcoa Aluminum. Well, you may remember 
that in the 60s, a man named Allende took over Chile. And when he took over the nation of Chile, he nationalized all the industries. And that's where some, where some of Alcoa's biggest aluminum mines were, copper mines. And suddenly they were pulled out from under them by the Allende government. So my parents' friend lost his job. He suddenly went from middle management to unemployment. So he needed to go to church to be comforted in that new change in his life. And his first job he got uh, after being let go from alcohol was as a salesman. He'd never been a salesman before, but that was the only job he could find at that time. Eventually he found a middle management job with some other company. But that's how he was coming to worship, to be comforted for the changes in our life, whether it's death, sickness, um, treatment, <coughs> loss of job, or even the breakup of a family. We go to worship to get guidance from God, to see God's guidance in our life, to see where God wants us to go, or to listen to hear if the Holy Spirit is calling us to a new position or to a new challenge in life. We go to hear a sermon. Now again, this is an area that in the past 30 years or so has taken a hit. Uh, you hear people complain about how long the pastor preaches. Um, one of my physical therapists uh, that I had, her father's a preacher. And so Monday when I was in physical therapy, she asked me, she says, how long do you preach on Sunday? And I said, well, normally I preach about 20 minutes, sometimes 18, sometimes if I get real fired up, 25. Occasionally I'm on 30. She goes, my dad preaches an hour every Sunday. I looked at her and I said, I'm glad I don't go to your daddy's church. <laughs> and that's what all the rest of the service to do. She says, we keep trying to tell him he's preaching too long, but he won't listen. Uh, but some people do come to worship in order to hear the sermon, to hear God's word. It was bound to them. We come to worship to receive Holy Communion, being assured of the forgiveness of our sin and the promise of everlasting life. We come to worship to be with family and friends. That Lutheran church I grew up in that first 13 years of my life. Both of my grandmas went there, a bunch of my aunts and uncles, a bunch of my cousins. So I show up on Sunday with a uh, time to be able to see family members who you may or may not have seen during the week. I, people go to worship to set an example for their children so that they'll train up their children properly. Children will learn uh, how to relate to God and to one another. The next three items you have listed uh, on your sheet are all part of what true worship is all about. We come to worship to sing. To sing praise to God. To sing praise to our Lord Jesus Christ and to the Holy Spirit. We come to worship to praise God. To thank Him for creating the world in which we live, providing us with food and clothing, home and shelter, and all we need from day to day, for giving us his only son as payment for the sin that we commit, so that we may have that forgiveness and that promise of eternal life. We come to worship to express thanksgiving to God for all the blessings he's bestowed upon us, and to be forgiven, to be assured that forgiveness comes from God our Father as a gift to us, and not as something that we have to try to earn, but instead it comes from his love. Then we have two bad reasons for going to worship. Because it's a habit. It should not be a habit, it should be enjoyed. But on one hand it's good, yes, you don't want to have a habit of going to church every morning, but you don't want to eat every Sunday, but you don't want to look at it as a habit that is something you just have to fulfill, like fulfilling uh, something on your job that is distasteful, like filling out an expense account or call, how many calls you make. Uh, because my spouse expects me to go. Now I have, in my 39 years, had a couple of couples and congregations I've served where one spouse or the other was coming because the spouse expected them to go. They much rather have been out on their boat or been golfing 
fishing or sleeping in or reading anything, but they wanted to keep their spouse happy. So they went. And then the last reason going to worship, because God expects me to go. Again, that could be positive or negative. Positive if you are going because God expects you because you have that reverence and all of God that we are told to have in the first commandment. To fear and love God above all things. Fear meaning to be in awe of God, have reverence for God. But it's negative if you're going because you're afraid God's going to punish you if you don't go to church or worship each Sunday. So these are reasons why people go to worship. And they basically break down into two categories. Which are the two main categories why people go to church? The one category is the category of going to worship in order to obtain something, or to gain something, or to receive something. The other category is going to worship in order to offer God something, to offer God yourself, to offer a commitment to our Lord Jesus Christ. To offer our Lord Jesus Christ to serve his world and to proclaim his gospel. Now society pushes us to want the idea of worship that we're going to gain something. We're going to be entertained or we're going to uh, be fed or we're going to have something exciting happen and unusual. But that is not what the purpose of worship is. It is for the people to be involved. Going to worship is the one aspect of Christian life in which we respond to God, we respond to Jesus Christ through the power of the Holy Spirit. That's biblical worship. To respond to God and Jesus Christ and to be guided by the Holy Spirit. The church as a body of Christ announces the claim of God upon all creation. And again, this is an area we sometimes forget that in Jesus' death upon the cross, he not only reconciled us to God, but he reconciled creation back to God. So that God is reconciled with us and the world that he created. The church is also a priesthood priesthood of believers, meaning that each and every one of us, no matter our station in life, no matter our income, no matter our education, no matter what we do, where we live, we all have direct access to God. We all can be a priest before God, asking God for whatever we need to ask, to thank God for whatever we want to thank Him for, to intercede to God on behalf of someone. We all have this right as the priesthood of all believers. Unlike the majority of religions of the world where you must have a priest or an imam or, or someone else intercede to God on your behalf or make a sacrifice to God on your behalf or intercede to God on your behalf. Each one of us are only priests before God. And each one of us can pray to God and that prayer has ever been as important and weighty as the prayer for the organized church. And so biblical worship involves each of us being our being a mediator between God and each other through the mediation of Jesus Christ. It doesn't take a parish pastor or a chaplain or a priest or pastor who's also a, a college professor to mediate a dispute between brothers and sisters in Christ. Any Christian can mediate a dispute between fellow Christians. That is part of being the priesthood of all believers. The clergy has its function of in order for there to be order in the church. We have those certain rights, Carol and I have, that you don't have. But when it comes to forgiveness, when it comes to mediation, all of us can do it. When it comes to praying, when it comes to interceding for someone or a situation, we all have that ability. The church patterned itself 
after Jesus' death and resurrection, and this is referred to as the Paschal Town. Because uh, we who worship are a Paschal people. And we are the people who center our lives around the suffering, death, and resurrection and ascension of Jesus Christ. And, and so, Paschal is a very important term in our Christian understanding. So, next you see on your page a list of key terms <coughs> that are important for us as Christians to understand. Church. The simplest definition of church is the people of God made members of his family through holy baptism. See, in our tradition, like that of the Anglican Church, the Roman Catholic Church, the Orthodox Churches, for us, baptism is very important. Baptism is an entrance right into God's kingdom. It's not simply standing up as an outward show that you believe in Jesus. It is an actual action where God, through water and the word, literally adopts us as his child into his kingdom. The second important word of worship, our adoring response to God in which we give him reverence and that is what biblical worship is all about. Adoring, our adoring response to God in which we give him reverence and praise. Not where we sit back to be entertained. Liturgy. Liturgy simply means a prescribed order of service. The word liturgy actually comes to us from a Greek word that means work of the people. The idea of liturgy is that everyone is participating. Yes, you have your priest or your pastor up front who is presiding over the service, but everyone participates. You're not just sitting there. The, this is one of the things that Gene and I have a hard time getting used to when we go to our middle son's church over in Indianapolis, which, as I've told you before, is one of these mega churches with the band and the lights and the screens and, and all that. But, when you go into worship and worship starts, they sing three songs. Uh, songs that our tradition commonly referred to as 711 songs. Seven words, some 11 times. Or 24 7 songs. Seven words, some 24 times. Uh, and they'll sing these three songs. And then everybody sits down. And one of the assistant pastors comes up and does a prayer. And may read a portion of scripture and talk about it a little bit. Then the head pastor, the main man, the one everybody's come to see, comes up. And he preaches from anywhere from 30 to 45 minutes. He has a screen that flashes up the answers to your sermon notes or will have some kind of scene or whatever to make an emphasis on a sermon, whatever he's talking about. Then he has a prayer. Then the invitation to accept Jesus into your heart. And they don't have an altar call in the sense of people coming forward. You just stay in your chair and raise your hand. And then they tell you how you can talk to someone after the service. Then they collect the offering. And then they sing one of the first three songs over again. So for and the service lasts around 55 minutes. 50 of those 55 minutes, you're just a spectator. That's not the idea of traditional worship in the church. Traditional worship, biblical worship, is that all the people are participating. So that's what liturgy means. It is a prescribed service in which the people are working just like reside. Work right, R-I-T-E, means the text of a liturgical worship service. Like the rite of confirmation, the rite of marriage, uh, last rites. Um, these are all the right means. This is the text for that action. Confirmation, marriage, so forth. Ceremonial means the physical movements and gestures of worship. Um, so we are have a ceremonial service because we have certain physical movements and gestures that emphasize different portions of our faith or expression of our faith. And then the word pastor, relating to Christ's passion, the suffering, and death on the cross. Uh, and that is what the whole worship is built around. Although we 
we bring our experience, thoughts, and feelings to worship, the focus of worship is God, not people. Worship grows out of and reflects God's word and God's self-revelation to us. And so we then acknowledge God's greatness and love for us through worship, putting that focus on him. As we heard in our Old Testament reading, and far as uh, instructions for worship, O oh, come, let us worship and bow down. Let us kneel before the Lord our Maker, for He is our God, and we are the people of His pasture and the sheep of His hand. John 4:23. But the hour is coming and is now here when the true worshiper will worship the Father in spirit and truth, for the Father is seeking such people to worship Him. So we worship in the Holy Spirit, the help of the Holy Spirit, and in the truth of the gospel. Uh, then you have the Great Commission there. That is there because that gives the church the authority to go out and make bring people into the family, into the church community, so they too can worship God as God intends. The other page that you have is actually something I give our alpha fans when we're studying the Ten Commandments. Um, and this relates to the Third Commandment. Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy, of course. As Christians, we do not worship on the traditional Sabbath. We worship on Sunday because of the resurrection of Jesus Christ. So the Third Commandment forbids despising preaching in His Word not attending public worship, not using the word of God in the sacraments, using the word of God in the sacraments negligently and carelessly, such as having a communion service and using Coke and potato chips instead of bread and wine in order to try to be cool with the kids. This commandment would have us hold preaching and the word of God sacred, would have us gladly hear it, learn it, and meditate. But one of the real reason I gave this to you was so that you could look at the church here. I don't know when it was the last time the church here was explained to you. But as a liturgical church, as we're referred to, our worship is based on the life of Jesus. And from Advent through Pentecost, we basically follow the chronology chronological life of Jesus from his birth to his ascension. From Pentecost until Advent begins again. The gospel readings are on lessons that the church needs to know and to share with each other as a community of faith and to share with the world uh, as seed to be harvested. So basically the church here runs from December to May, and all depending on when um, Easter falls, depending on when the first Sunday of Advent. Sometimes the first Sunday of Advent is in November, sometimes it's December, but in the Advent season, the message is to prepare for the coming of Christ. Both his coming in glory, his second coming, and then his being closer to Christmas to prepare for celebrate his first coming, his coming in humility. Then we celebrate the Christmas season, 12 days of Christmas. Christmas is not December 24th and 25th. It's December 24th through January 6th, Epiphany Sunday. Um, then in, after Epiphany, we have the Epiphany season where we have the first public action of Jesus, usually for our gospel lesson. Then we have the Lent season where the emphasis, of course, is on the passion of Jesus on his journey to the cross. So the lessons deal with those last teachings he made before his betrayal, his crucifixion and resurrection. Holy Week, of course, the most holiest week in the Christian calendar, the most special week. Then the highest festival of all, the resurrection of our Lord. We then have six Sundays of Easter following the actual Easter Sunday, all dealing with the resurrection of Jesus, and then the last couple of lessons dealing with what the resurrection means for the church. Um, then we have 
Pentecost, the birthday of the church, and then we go into the season after Pentecost, or as some churches refer to as ordinary time. Again, where the gospel emphasis is on different teachings that we should understand and share with others. So uh, that is why our pyramids change in color for different months. That is why our gospel lessons are like they are. Uh, and the Old Testament lesson usually lines up with the same theme as the New Testament, as the gospel lesson. The epistle sometimes is the same theme or it may be a teaching that comes out of whatever the gospel lesson was about. Colossians 3, 16, 17, we read, Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly, teaching and admonishing one another in all wisdom, singing psalms and hymns and spiritual songs with thankfulness in your hearts to God. And whatever you do in word or deed, do everything in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through him. Sums up better than I can what worship really is all about as we respond to God's love that He first showed us. Next week we will examine the sacraments. What are they? Why are they important? Why are they necessary? Uh, so now let us turn to page 314 in the front of our worship book, beginning with the response to is the terrible change long ago. We're doing the response in the middle of page 314. And then the gospel canticle as printed in here is a little bit hard to do if you're unfamiliar with it. It is Mary's song. So there are other hymns that are also Mary's song. We are going to be singing 251 instead of the gospel canticle. So we're only on page 314 for the response. Long ago God spoke to our ancestors in many and various ways by the prophets. But in these last days God has spoken to us by the Son.
of my Lord singing, Lord, have mercy. But we do that, all of the petitions except the last two. Those are different, but if you follow, you'll see. In peace, let us pray to the Lord.
Uh, also, a uh, couple of announcements besides thank you, Pastor Carol, for being here and leading us through this this Sunday at 10:30 uh, for our special music. The choir will not be here, and our special music will be William, the grandson of Dr. Confucius and Dr. Abbott, who will be playing the uh, viola. viola, or viola, yeah, viola. 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 Being from Kentucky, I won't say viola. <laughs> viola, viola. Special piece from Bach that is very moving, and so I, I encourage you to be here at 10:30 uh, to William uh, perform this piece to the glory of God. Uh, and again, thank you for being here this evening. Again, next week the sacraments. Uh, so go in peace, serve the Lord. Thanks be to God. God. I, if you have offering, there is an offering plate set up in the back. I stand back there. Thank you for watching on YouTube our midweek service during Lent. Lent is a time of fasting, almsgiving, and prayer, and we are here learning about worship. We were able to participate, honored to participate, in one of the oldest services known to the Christian Church, 100 years after Jesus' death. This is a Vesper service. We're thankful for all the blessings given to us in worship as we are able to pray, be forgiven of our sins, to receive Holy Communion, to do all the things that God wants us to do. God, our Creator, our Redeemer, Jesus Christ, who died on the cross to save us from sin, the Holy Spirit who comforts us day by day, who gives us healing, who lets us know God's will. We pray for God's will to be done every day in our lives. This is Lent. This is the midweek Wednesday service. We invite you to come next Wednesday, supper at 6.30. Uh, five, uh, correction, correction, uh, it's uh, services at 5.30 for supper and services at 7. Pastor will lead us in studying all the words that have to do with our Christian faith. As we know that we are together forever through God's blessing. We pray for the blessing of all those around us. We thank you for Holy Communion. We thank you that we have eternal life. Jesus Christ died on the cross to save us from our sins. We're thankful for that. And we're here to worship and show our gratefulness. We invite you to worship with us 8 o'clock Sunday morning, 10.30 Sunday morning, and 9.15 Sunday school. Come anytime. All are welcome. We break down barriers. There's no barrier to you coming to Jesus Christ. He's always open. His arms are open. He will welcome you with arms of love.